Hello, good evening. This is the Al 24 News. I'm Abdurrahim Kashur, and to the headlines. New coronavirus variant on Macron keeps spreading all over the world and re rising concern as to put in place strict measures to curb it. Plus, the United States Secretary of State Antony Blinken is deeply worried by Ethiopia's military escalation and has called for urgent talks to resolve the problem. And in sport, Palmeiras see off Flamingo in extra time to retain Copa Libertadores title. Hello again. Those were today's headline. Starting from Algeria, Mohamed Shorfi, authorities chairman announced this morning that the elections participation rate was 35% in communal assemblies and 34% in provincial ones. More details about these elections in this report. The local elections began yesterday as polling stations opened at 8 a.m. and closed at 7 p.m. with more than 15,000 candidates running for the elections. Voters were not numerous in the morning but stations saw more crowds in the afternoon. Abdel Majid Taboun, the President of the Republic, accomplished his electoral duty yesterday in Ahmed Urwa School in Stawali, west of Algiers, and affirmed that the local elections are the last stage for the building of a modern state. Citizenship is a learning process. It's not innate, yet voting remains a national duty. We should all keep each other aware of this. This is the last stage for the building of a modern state with the participation of its children, who choose their representatives. We will build an economically strong state within democracy and citizen freedom. According to the president of the National Independent Authority for Elections, Mohamed Shorfi, the turnout rate was of 35.97% in communal assembly and 34.39% in provincial assembly. The number of electors right after closing the polling stations reached around 8 million voters, where the turnout rate was of 35.97% in communal assemblies and 34.39% in the provincial assemblies. The turnout rate reached an average of 35%, or 12 points more than the last election, the legislative elections in June. The French government took a decision of postponing the vaccine mandate, which was set to take place amongst French medical staff. This decision was taken after the last protests, which erupted in the two Caribbean islands in rejection of the mandate vaccine. The protests left injured police officers and journalists were attacked. The measures of mandatory vaccine is already function over French territory. World countries started detecting cases of the new Omicron COVID-19 variant as many countries announced positive tests of most people returning from South African countries. European countries already banned flights coming from the South African countries as a first measure in response to the first spread of this strain. Complexity and panic represent the dominant image of the world after the discovery of a new COVID-19 variant in South Africa. And most countries are racing to introduce travel bans and restrictions over Southern African countries. Starting from Monday, the USA is banning flights from South Africa and seven African countries, with exception only for American citizens and residents. Austria discovered its first Omicron suspect in Trial, who is a traveler who returned back from South Africa and tested positive with the symptoms of the new variant. But according to Trial officials, confirmation needs more sequencing. After two cases were confirmed in the UK, British Health Secretary stated that vaccine may be less effective against the new Omicron variant. And mandatory mask wearing starts on Tuesday as a temporary measure in response to the new strain. But we now need to go further and implement a proportionate testing regime for arrivals from across the whole world. So, 
Urgent testing started in Australia after two people returning in a flight from South Africa were detected with a new variant. Australian authorities imposed new restrictions starting from Saturday on people coming from nine African countries. Bavaria's health organization announced the isolation of two people who came back from South Africa with symptoms of the new Omicron variant of COVID-19 and South Africa's considered a virus variant area. Over 60 passengers were suspected to have the new corona variant in the Netherlands. The passengers returned this week from South Africa, according to Dutch officials. Most countries around the world are in a race with this rapidly spread COVID variant, and the world is about to witness new restrictions and stricter impositions. New COVID-19 cases have been discovered among passengers who flew in from South Africa, according to Dutch health officials. We suspect some of the illness are the new Omicron strain. The cases were detected among 624 passengers arriving on two flights at Amsterdam's Schiphol Airport on Friday. Those who tested positive have been placed in an isolation facility near the airport. The World Health Organization named the new and potentially more transmissible coronavirus variant as Omicron, describing it as a var variant of concern. They said that multiple studies are underway as advisors continue to monitor this letter. Zara Ferjani on what follow. The health officials have stated that the new Omicron coronavirus variant has shown the pandemic is far from over. Despite only being tracked for the past five days, the virus has already been found to have 30 different mutations. The mutations contain features seen in all of the other variants, but also traits that have not been seen before. And the mutations um, show evidence of uh, increased transmissibility, uh, increased infectivity, and also evidence that it could evade the immune response and also the um, uh, treatment uh, with monoclonal antibodies such as Ronaprev. All those are very concerning. It is too early to say vaccines protect people against Omicron. Work is underway to see whether the new variant may be causing new infection in people who have already had coronavirus or whether waning immunity may be playing a role. It's the mutations that again tell us that it has differences that are there. However, the vaccine is not an all or nothing. And I think it's really important, even more important now that people come out and get their booster doses, because having high levels of um, immune response from the booster dose is the one thing that will help overcome this sort of variation. The vaccine um, in in the introduces not only antibodies in our system, but also introduces T cell responses, which are very broad. And so while I think this may reduce the effectiveness of vaccine compared to other variants, I don't think it will mean the vaccine won't work completely. But what it does mean that, you know, boosters become even more important right now. So far, cases of the variant have appeared primarily in young people, leaving them exhausted and with body aches and soreness. Pfizer BioNTech, which has produced a vaccine against COVID-19, is already studying a new variant's ability to evade vaccines. And for more details about this new variant, this new virus that's called Omicron, uh, joining me live via phone call from the United Kingdom, Dr. Amin Boulam. Hello, Dr. Amin. Well, hello, good evening. Good Thank evening, you so sir. much for having this call. It's a pleasure, so is mine. Dr. Amin, after the detection of this newly born virus, Macron, that is said has been exposed in South Africa, what is the situation now precisely in UK and generally in Europe? Yes, I think uh, since the announcement of the two cases in the UK, found in the UK, uh, uh, very likely travellers uh, from, uh, from uh, South Africa, we... Um, the UK government has uh, announced, um, you know, they are investigating, obviously, the new variant, uh, Omicron. And um, as usual, like previously we did for other variants, um, there were a few restrictions. And the UK Prime Minister has uh, announced, you know, a uh, few uh, precautions to take while, while they are assessing the risks of this new uh, viral sort of variant. Um, for the time being, you know, we're still waiting for more information about this variant to come to conclusions, really.
Dr. Amin, in, as a second question, can we say what kind of reservation, what kind of precaution that the UK government will take to face this, this, this spread? I think the UK government this time is, uh, is taking the risks and precautions uh, kind of uh, as, a, as a priority on um, initially taking precautions and then investigating and uh, updating the population. So for the, for the time being, the, the, the UK Prime Minister has announced uh, that the mask, we should use masks in transportation, in trains and buses and other crowded transportations, and also to use our, to wear our masks in shops. So that's the thing they're going to be um, sort of in, installed maybe you know um, this week this coming week and uh, also there have been a, a, an instructions to have a, a PCR test for people traveling coming back from uh, international internationally to the airport and other other borders and the third thing instructions is there the UK government has issued a ban a traveling ban on six sort of countries from Africa. I think it is temporary for the moment. And uh, they've asked their UK travellers coming from these countries as well to have, to, to quarantine once they arrive into the UK. So for the time being, you know, there's no big panic here, but I think precautions are being taken. And these three precautions have uh, initially been uh, of, you know, they are formalized by the UK Prime Minister. Well, the lack of the information is shared and mutual between doctors as well as the journalism field. Dr. Amir, thank you so much for the information you have given. We catch you later, inshallah. Inshallah, thank you. Thank you very much for having That's me. You. Now, staying in Europe, the crisis on Belarusian border involving thousands of migrants from Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, and different places in attempt to get into the European Union has dragged on for a month in which led to smugglers create fake hopes for many distressed migrants in faith to cross the borders and take advantage. Marwa Bilewar on this report will clarify more situation. After Poland and the European Union accused President Alexander Lukashenko of encouraging the migrants to travel to Belarus and cross the border illegally as revenge for the imposition of sanctions against Minsk over human rights abuses, also the denial of Belarus of all charges blaming the European Union for the humanitarian crisis on the border, migrants face a much tougher challenge now to enter the European Union. While Belarusian authorities have taken many migrants back to Minsk with the aim of letting them return to their homelands, Poland has arranged over 20,000 border guards, soldiers and police in sealed-off border zone. Police data shows around 314 smugglers, most of them from Germany, Sweden, Ukraine and Georgia, have been detained in Poland since August. The smugglers gave fake hopes for migrants to cross borders after many of them got caught by guards. According to an asylum seeker, he and his five relatives lost 18,000 euros to smugglers who promised to take them to a safe apartment with a car driving ahead of them to make sure there were no police checks. That also proved a lie and they were caught. More people are becoming aware that they have been let into a trap and that what they've been promised is all a lie. As crossings have become more difficult, migrants told news agencies the people smugglers have hiked their prices to as much as $7,000. Some activists claim that the migrants are unlikely to give up trying to get cross, despite the falling temperatures and increased risks of being caught. According to media reports, demonstrators in the northern port city of Alexandropoli protest amid increased American military presence in Greece. Various trade unions, pensioner unions, students' union, and the local branch of the International Decency and Peace Committee took part in the demonstration organized by the Committee of Struggle against the Greek-American Military Treaty in the base of Alexandropoli, according to the news outlet. 
Environmental group are angry over recent referendum reform and oppose the new expropriation law, which allows the acquisition of private land. Thus, hundreds of people took part in the protests in Belgrade and elsewhere, which led to combats between police and demonstrators. More to be clarified in this report. Hundreds of people showed up at the same time in Belgrade in the northern city of Novi Sad and other sites to barricade main bridges and roads. In what organizers labored a warning blockade, they promised more demonstrations on the laws on property expropriation, which allows the mandatory acquisition of private land by the state within eight days. Environmental groups and civil society organizations are mad over recent referendum reform, which they say will effectively stop popular initiatives against polluting projects by establishing hefty administrative fees. Activists argue the moves will pave the way for foreign companies to evade popular displeasure over projects as the bid by Rio Tinto to launch a lithium mine in western Serbia. Serbia's authorities have rejected the accusations, saying the new laws are needed because of infrastructure projects. President Aleksandr Vucic said a referendum will be organized on the Rio Tinto mine. Experts have warned that the planned lithium mine would destroy farmland and pollute the waters. Rio Tinto has said it would adhere to all domestic and European Union environmental standards at the site. Following decades of neglect, Serbia has faced major environmental problems such as air and water pollution, poor waste management and other issues. Serbia is a candidate nation for European Union entry, but little so far has been achieved with regards to improving the country's environmental situation. Soldiers and police from Australia were assisting us in restoring order in the Solomon Island as cleanup operation began following several days of unrest that killed three people and resulted in thousands of arrests. Here is our own Islam in this report. Shattered glass, burned out shops, rubble and mounds of rubbish from the streets. That's what's left after the anarchy. A reminder of looting and rioting that broke out following protests over poverty, hunger and Sugavari's policies. Honiaro residents started a cleanup campaign in the streets after the deadly riots. As soldiers and police from Australia and Papua New Guinea helped to restore calm and peace. Protesters attempted to storm the parliament of the Pacific Island nation, as many believe their government is corrupt and swayed by Beijing and other foreign powers. The prime minister on his behalf saw the unrest as a conspiracy that had taken on a political dimension, stating that people with evil motives were plotting to depose him. The economy was anticipated to lose at least $28 million with the bank's governor warning that the riots had undermined the country's accounts, which were already battling to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. I've made that very clear. Our presence there does not indicate any position on the internal issues of the Solomon Islands. It is there in direct response to a request made by the Prime Minister so we can be present to assist the Royal Solomon Islands Police Force to be able to ensure that police uh, can provide stability and security so the normal constitutional processes can be undertaken. Meanwhile, Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison announced that more Australian Federal Police will arrive in the Solomon Islands on Sunday and that Fiji will also send troops. He also stated that the Solomon Islands were responsible for resolving the conflict. United States Secretary Antony Blinken said he is greatly concerned about Ethiopia's military escalation and called for urgent negotiation over the crisis. In Ethiopia, state's affiliate found a broadcasting report that Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed was on the front line with the army fighting Tigrayan forces in the northeastern Afar region. Tensions have risen again on the borders of Ethiopia and Sudan after clashes between Sudanese army forces and the Ethiopian army, which left casualties among the two sides. The clashes took place in Al Fashka, which is considered as another focus of tension between the two countries. Islam Seed on what follow. Without giving the ultimate death toll, according to military sources, more than six Sudanese soldiers were killed by Ethiopian forces in a disputed border region. 
A Sudan military has said that Ethiopian militias and army forces intended to frighten farmers and destroy the harvest season before attacking Sudanese forces, whose mission was to secure the harvest in Fashaka. However, Sudanese troops deterred the attack and inflicted heavy losses in lives and equipment on the Ethiopian army. Al Fashaka is a border zone claimed by Sudan, but traditionally cultivated by Ethiopian farmers. The zone, which is also borders Ethiopia's unstable Tigray region, has seen periodic violent clashes in recent years, but then worsened last year. Tensions intensified after conflict broke out in Tigray in November 2020, sending tens of thousands of refugees into Sudan. Since then, Khartoum and Addis Ababa have been engaged in a violent verbal battle over the region, accusing each other of violence and territorial violations. Saying in Africa to Burkina Faso now, military police launched tear gas to separate about 100 protesters trying to march toward downtown Ouagadougou to protest the government's failure to suppress violence. The details in what follow. Security forces fired tear gas at protesters throwing rocks in Burkina Faso's capital on Saturday as tensions rose across the conflict-riddled nation with the population angry at the government's inability to stem violence linked to Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State group. Several hundred protesters took to the streets, calling for President Rockmark Christian Kabore to resign. The army and police drove through downtown Ouagadougou, the capital, during clashes with protesters who barricaded streets, set fire to tyres and threw rocks and bricks. We are marching, we are protesting today to demand our rights as Burkinabi people. They are our brothers, our soldiers who are dying. We are here to demand our rights. We have come out to say that the killing must stop now. What they are doing to the armed forces, to the population must stop now. The protest comes after the deadliest attack in years against the security forces in the South Sum province earlier this month, where more than 50 security forces were killed, and after an attack in the centre-north region where 19 people, including nine members of the security forces, were killed. The unrest against the government also comes in the wake of anti-French protests last week where at least four people were injured when French forces fired warning shots at protesters in Kaya, who stopped its military convoy coming from Ivory Coast that was trying to pass into Niger. While Saturday's protest was mostly against the government, anti-French protesters threw rocks at foreigners as well. The government's crackdown on the protesters follows a week of mobile internet shutdown, which the government said was for national security reasons. The president vowed to increase aid to the military and investigate the deaths in the Sahel, while calling on the population to maintain calm. But anger across the country is mounting with more protests planned in the coming weeks. Earlier this month, the opposition gave the president a one-month ultimatum to stem the violence or said it would begin protests demanding his resignation. According to semi-official Isna News Agency, the Iranian negotiating team led by Ali Barikani held bilateral and lateral meeting in Vienna Sunday ahead of a reception of a nuclear talks to bring back a 2015 agreement between Iran and major powers Iranian diplomats Mohammed Gabi told Isna that the Iranian team arrived in Vienna on Saturday and began ex expert-level meeting with heads of Russian and Chinese negotiating teams, as well as the EU coordinator Enrique Mora. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan and his Iranian counterpart Sayyid Ibrahim Raisi met on the sideline of the 50th Economic Cooperation Organization Summit in Turkmenistan. Iran and Turkey can bring the economic and political relations between the two countries closer to strategic level by improving the current level of trade and exchanges. Referring to the wide and diverse areas of cooperation between Iran and Turkey in various sectors, including energy, banking and monetary affairs and trade and commerce. The, the Iranian president added that we must facilitate the development of economic ties and in this regard, uh, pre professional tar tariffs can be reviewed. The Iranian president said terrorist groups not only cause insecurity in Afghanistan but also threaten the security of the region. So we should not allow terrorist groups like 
Daesh and the PKK to increase the in insecurity of the countries in the region. Taliban Prime Minister Mullah Mohammed Hassan said efforts are underway to expand educational facilities for women. The, prime, the Premier called in international charities to provide their aid as the country faces famine, unemployment and financial crisis. Let's follow this report for better information. Taliban Prime Minister Mullah Mohammed Hassan Akun said efforts are underway to expand educational facilities for women. As he made his first public speech to the nation since the Taliban captured Kabul and secured their rule over the country three months ago. We're increasing the number of education facilities for women considering certain Islamic rules and trying as much as possible to solve the problems of the people. We're working overtime in every department. The Taliban's takeover resulted in the suspension of international aid to the government and the freezing of billions of dollars in Afghan assets held abroad, further destabilizing the country's already fragile economy. The United States and other countries refused to recognize the Taliban as Afghanistan's legitimate government, resulting in the cessation of aid that accounted for over 75% of the country's GDP. International loans were also stopped by the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. Western countries have committed to maintain their economic sanctions against Afghanistan's new authorities until the Taliban establishes an inclusive government that respects women's rights. Akund claims that his newly established Islamic Emirate has adherents from across the country and that his ban on women working and girls attending school has protected women's dignity and called on international charities to provide their aid as the country faces mass starvation threats, unemployment and financial meltdown. Kyrgyzstan is voting in parliamentary pools as tension rise after claims of plot and such populist President Saeedar Jabarov, who rose to power in post-vote unrest last year. There was little signs of excitement about the vote on Sunday in the capital Beskak. Well, both Russian and uh, Kyrgyzstan are spoken. The vote in expected delivery, 90 seats parliaments largely loyal to Jabarov. China and Russia have separately condemned what they see as destabilizing U.S. military moves near their respective borders and have jointly called for intensifying their already growing strategic partnership. Let's follow this report for better explanation. On Friday, Chinese ambassador to the United States, Qing Gang, and Russian ambassador to the United States, Anatoly Antonov, jointly published an article in the National Interest magazine titled Respecting People's Democratic Rights to criticize the Biden administration's Summit for Democracy on December 9th and 10th which will stoke up ideological confrontation, according to the article. The President of the United States, Joe Biden, will hold a virtual summit for democracy in which this will fuel up ideological clash and a split in the world, establishing new dividing lines since it is entirely a product of its Cold War mentality. This trend runs counter to the modern world's development, the formation of a global polycentric architecture is essential, but may put a burden on the objective process. China and Russia are fiercely opposed to this plan, as stated in the article. The event that will take place in early December will be the first of two democratic summits hosted by Biden. According to the U.S. Department of State, it will focus on three important themes, defending against authoritarianism, confronting and fighting corruption, and promoting respect for human rights. Musical theatre world lost one of its giant artists, Stephen Soundham, wrote his name with extraordinary musical works that will remain forever in the world of music, theatre and, song, and songwriting. Soundham passed away on Friday at the age of 91 at his home in a living history for his audience and the musical world in general. Entertainment world is in mourn. 
as it lost the Oscar-winning and Broadway composer and lyricist Stephen Sondheim. On Friday, the music theatre giant passed away at the age of 91, leaving an endless number of works that keeps him alive in the music and theatre world forever. Sondheim was born in 1930 in New York City, and soon he became an important figure in the 20th century musical theatre. Pleasure because, as most of you know, the, the show that Lee was referring to, her baptism in musical theatre, was Anyone Can Whistle, and I'm responsible partly for that running only six performances. He was credited for reinventing the American musical, as his shows tackled unexpected themes that were fairly creative compared to the genre's traditional subjects. His music and lyrics were unprecedented in complexity and extraordinary in sophistication. An acclaimed lyricist and composer, Stephen Sondheim is a master of the American musical. His witty, poignant shows tell tales of misfits, romantics, dreamers, and lunatics. The range of work including a funny thing happened on the way to the Forum, Company, Follies, and Sunday in the Park with George sparked in the theater musical world to give chance to the audience to live the joy that he left in his music. Sondheim won many awards that include eight Tony Awards, nine Grammys, an Oscar, and a list of well-needed awards for the history he made. So what I learned from him was, you know, how to tell a story and song, which is not what Cole Porter was doing or Roger and Hart. There are other ways to write songs and other uses of them. Sondheim's death was announced by his lawyer and friend, F. Richard Pappas, who described his death as sudden, and the day before, he had Thanksgiving dinner with his friends. And ending up with point, the Premier League Manchester City held off a late fight back from West Ham United to secure three points at the Al Etihad Stadium. Ilkay Gandogan gave the City the lead in the first half and Fernandinho doubled the advantage in the 90th minute with Manuel Lanzini scoring a conservation goal for the Hammers. To this end, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us. Take care of yourself. Good night.